Good afternoon. I'm Nick Crowley. I'm the Director of HR here at Macquarie University. Um, and welcome to the first event of our third annual Gender Equity Week. Um, as is right and proper, we start proceedings such as these with a welcome to country. Welcome. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of Macquarie University land, the Watamadigal clan of the Darug Nation, whose cultures and customs have nurtured this land since the dream time. We pay our respects to elders past, present and future. We welcome people of all nations and all faiths. Kwai Bidja, Jamna Payala Janawi. Come here, we speak together. We have 60,000 years of archaeological evidence of Aboriginal habitation at Lake Mungo and 20,000 years in Ride. We have great antiquity. Today, hundreds of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people graduate from Macquarie University. The Darug Nation had famous leaders such as Chief Yaramundi, Naraginji, Colby and Maria Locke. Many of the descendants of these Darug people live today amongst you. We celebrate with you our ongoing attachment and custodianship of this country. We celebrate the achievements of Macquarie University. I'd also like to acknowledge that we meet here today on Aboriginal land, pay my respects to elders past, present and future. So, as I say, this is the first event of our third Gender Equity Week at Macquarie University. Gender Equity Week gives us an opportunity to come together and be inspired by new ideas from leading thinkers, researchers and importantly doers who will, speak, who will spark deep discussion and connections across our community. This week, we shift the gender balance of our speakers to give a voice to women, challenging and raising awareness about gender stereotypes and biases. As a community, we can be very proud of the work that we've done over the past three years towards redressing the imbalance in gender equity. Under our workplace gender equity strategy, many people from all areas of the university have contributed as ideas, efforts and energy and are working together to build a better, fairer and more inclusive university for everyone. We've been recognised in our work in this area for our progress and leadership with an Athena Swan Institutional Bronze Award and two weeks ago the Workplace Gender Equity Agency employer of choice for gender equality citation. It really rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Um, but it's good. Um, support for Gender Equity Week has grown each year, and this year we have the highest number of registrations. And I know that, that Joe and the gender, um, the equity and diversity team are delighted to see a growth in um, diversity within registrations. So thank you for your participation and your support. There's an enormous amount of events on this week and I'd encourage you to, to register for more events if you haven't. Um, I look forward to continuing the university's important work towards equality, diversity and inclusion. So I now get to hand over to the person who's going to hand over to the guest speaker. So if you'd like to join me in welcoming Leslie Hughes to the stage. Thank you. Thanks. How, how am I going to um, thank you, Nick, and, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Good afternoon. Um, as Nick said, this is um, our first official event of Gender Equity Week, which we have now run three times. So, as Nick said, also, uh, please consider coming to some of the other events uh, later in the week. Um, what we have now, though, leading off is our Macquarie University International Women's Day Lecture. And it's my enormous pleasure to introduce our friend and colleague, Catherine Lumby. Um, in our two previous years, we have had Cordelia Fine from the University of Melbourne as our first speaker. We had Catherine Fox last year as our second. So we've gone homegrown um, this time. So let me tell you a little bit about Catherine. So she's a professor of media here at Macquarie. She's the author of six books and is currently writing a biography of Frank Morehouse, who's an Australian author and a very, very interesting guy from what she's been telling me. Um, she's been awarded, she's a very active researcher. She's been awarded 10 Australian uh, Research Council grants. 
and has conducted projects for organisations as diverse as Google, the National Rugby League, the Australian Communication and Media Authority and the ABC. Before entering academia, she was a print and television journalist working for the Sydney Morning Herald, the ABC and the Bulletin. The title of her talk is um, very, very topical, as you will see, due to some events that happened overseas last week, uh, but she will be explaining that. So please welcome Professor Catherine Lumby. Well, I want to say it's an enormous privilege to be asked to um, give this talk. In 2017, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell's defence of a rare move to silence Senator Elizabeth Warren on the floor of the US Senate launched a thousand tweets. Senator Warren was giving a lengthy speech, he said. She appeared to violate the rule. She was warned. She was given an explanation. Nevertheless, she persisted. As Amy Wang, a reporter for the Washington Post, wrote at the time, if the Republican senators had intended to minimise Warren's message, the, the decision backfired severely. Her supporters immediately seized upon McConnell's line giving Warren a far bigger megaphone than if they had simply let her continue speaking in what had been a mostly empty chamber. Thanks for the new battle cry, one person tweeted. An off-the-cuff phrase meant to end a debate was instead turned into a badge of honour by the other side. Hashtag she persisted, hashtag let Liz speak, hashtag silencing Elizabeth Warren, were among Twitter's top te trending topics in the US the next day. I proudly own a nevertheless she per persisted t-shirt and I wear it to annoy my teenagers. <laughs> Women in particular bristled at the sentiment, essentially to sit down and stop talking and noted that the, it was hardly unfamiliar to them. So I'll just give you a, a little anecdote here. Um, and I won't name where this happened or who was involved. And in fact, I don't think any of the men involved in this particular anecdote were intentionally being sexist towards me. But um, as a female professor, Leslie will be you know, very familiar with this, you were asked to sit on a lot of interview panels and promotion committees because of gender balance, if they need professors. And I was running five or 10 minutes late to this panel and uh, I arrived, you know, it was summer, I was in a frock like this. I wasn't sort of wearing a, a tweed jacket with leather patches or smoking a pipe or any of the things that professors are meant to do. And um, I knew a couple of the guys on the panel, but I, one of them didn't know me. And as I walked into the room, he looked up, he went, ah, I'll have a macchiato. And I said, sure. If we've got time, I'll run to the coffee cart. Anyone else want a coffee? And the other men on the panel who knew me were looking like this down at their feet. And I came back and I, by this stage, the guy had been apprised that I was actually on the panel. I wasn't um, you know, someone there to get the coffees. And he was deeply apologetic. And I said, you know what? It's okay, we all make these assumptions about gender. I'm probably just as guilty as you are at times. And I didn't want to shame you and I didn't want to make you feel bad. But what I did want to state was that I can be a professor and I can buy people coffees, you know? Um, but it's interesting how you get read off your body. So what does it mean to persist when it comes to ensuring we have gender equality in an age of great uncertainty, in an era of media and political disruption? at a time when the fourth estate is in flux and information increasingly comes to us through social and online media. In short, what's a feminist chick to do? 
Should I put those overalls I bought in the 1980s back on and make another placard? Or should I tweet into the ether? And what should I tweet or write? What works? And that's the question that really interests me. What is the mode of engagement that allows us to speak beyond our own echo chambers? Um, and, and today I'll really be posing questions. You know, I don't have the answers to this, but these are questions that I want to conjure with. And I want us to all think collectively about that today. And goodness knows we need the collective back. And by the collective, I don't mean those annoying consciousness raising, raising groups. Um, if any of you have ever sat in a collective where people sat around and argued about whether Marxist feminism or liberal feminism was more important or whether there was really such a thing as a feminist orgasm. Who knows, I don't think we've worked that out. The collective I like is the one where we agree to disagree and invite men and people who are trans and gender fluid um, <clears throat> to be on the journey that we're all on to see gender equality achieved. And this is particularly important to me, that kind of thinking about that collective broadly, not just about men who are our allies, but about trans and gender fluid people. I have a child called Sam who was 18 and she's a feminist, but she was born a male, but she identifies as a female now. And we talk about feminist politics all the time she tries to explain Judith Butler to me. Some in the room will be familiar with Judith Butler's work. She's a gender theorist, um, which I find wonderful, hilarious, and patronising all at the same time. Which takes me to a segue. What stands in our way? What stands in the way of equality for all of us? Because I believe that achieving more equality for women also expands opportunities for men to be whole people and not to be pigeonholed themselves. So here's a thought. The man on the right is Andrew Bolt. When I was Googling images of Andrew Bolt, what came up was the man on the left, who's awesome. The man on the right, however, is a right-wing commentator who writes a syndicated column for News Limited. Bolt is notorious among intellectuals and progressives. Um, in Australia for his conservative views, which play to his audience of often right-leaning readers. Whether writing on climate change, indigenous rights or feminism, anger is one of his signature emotions. And that's sort of served him pretty well in the traditional media in the kind of readership that he's garnered. He also has a TV show and a radio show, so he's got you know, quite a lot of um, airspace, if we can put it that way. But as Andrew Bolt found out in, in 2013, Twitter is not a compliant platform for lecturing people. During the run-up to the 2013 federal election, he, or perhaps his newspaper, sent a tweet inviting people to question him on anything in regard to the forthcoming election. The idea was clearly an invitation to approach Bolt so he could give his opinion on politics. Now those of you who are active on Twitter, think about this. What happens if you send out a tweet saying, ask me anything? <laughs> you can see what, came, what was coming. The swift Twitter response from Bolt's, Bolt's opponents mocked his ask me anything status as a guru on politics. Questions included. Is it true that winter is coming? Do you know the way to Scarborough Fair? And my personal favourite, Andrew, where are my car keys? <laughs> it's just, it's too good to be true, isn't it? During his online chat and in a subsequent post, Bolt reacted to being mocked with great anger. In response to the question, what would you do if I sang out of tune? <laughs> he wrote, it's bizarre that the left has spent 24 hours hyperventilating on Twitter and thinking up questions. Is this one of the best they could come up with? Now, the Australian bulk Twitter storm illustrates a trope now common in political debate. The contest between self-righteous anger and satire. And 
while I'm at this, I'm just going to show you this cartoon which goes back to this concept of telling women to be quiet. <laughs> so one of the problems is the polemic nature of it. So for bulk critics, you know, mocking him was a great source of fun. But for Bolt supporters, it simply illustrated what they saw as this nasty, nasty hectoring tendency of people on the left. And this impasse, common in social media, represents a clash of discursive frames, which brings me back to the question of what effective activism looks like for the supporters of gender equity today. What does a good conversation about gender equity look like? not just to people who support it already. Now, is this what it looks like? Most of you will know this is Tarana Burke, a civil rights activist from the Bronx in New York who founded the Me Too movement, and that was in 2006, to draw attention on social media to the, the pervasiveness of sexual assault and abuse in society, which disproportionately affects women and children. The movement she started with a keyboard has now gone global, as we all know, and resulted in some high-profile prosecutions. And no, I'm not going to show you a picture of Harvey Weinstein. I don't, think, I don't think we want him in our heads the day after International Women's Day, do we? But there are some really important questions we need to ponder about the hashtag MeToo movement and its ability to achieve lasting change, which is both ethical and equitable. And, and, and the ethical dimension of call out and cancel culture on social media troubles me as a feminist. And here's where I'm going to get a little bit academic on you. Um, <clears throat> so if you have a hip flask of martinis, which all feminists carry and need, now is the time to take a swig. I promise I won't get too academic. A leading Australian scholar investigating the affordances of feminist online activism is Emma Jane. She's based at UNSW. And she suggests that activism can descend into non-engagement or talking past one another. She writes, the heated exchanges between feminists and men's rights activ activists, as well as the tit-for-tat digilantism, demonstrate the way online debates can involve a series of escalating hostilities in which antagonists appear to increasingly mirror each other. And she goes on to look at this, the phenomenon of manspreading. Now, some of you will know that manspreading became a meme on social media. Um, and she tackles this practice, the practice of some men in public places to sit, sit with their legs widely spread and taking up more room than others. Um, and she examines the online campaigns against the practice, which involve exposing men who refuse to move aside by posting photographs um, and satirising their behaviour. Offline behaviour was also reported online. For example, women sitting in the laps of men who refuse to move. Jane here, uh, Emma Jane here is inter interrogates Chantal Muth's well-known theory of agonistic pluralism, which posits that conflict is a necessary and essential part of democratic debate. Indeed, that rifting um, and, and almost you know, polemics to some extent is essential to democracy. Following Muth, Jane looks at the effectiveness of various strategies to make women's invisibility in public spaces visible. And she notes that humour, satire and sarcasm are frequent features of memes online. But importantly, she considers whether femi feminist digilantism may alienate and divide or be itself invisible to a broader public. Is it, in essence, a mirror of the trolling that feminist activists sometimes endure? Is it a form of activism that only resounds in an echo chamber? Her research question goes to the heart of understanding political activism in an era of fragmented identity politics and a fractured media and public sphere. It is a complex question 
and one that Emma Jane intentionally leaves open. Now, concerns about how we manage and enable civic or democratic discussion have a long history that I'm not going to take you through here and many of you will know about. Um, but I will uh, go to this one theorist who really impresses me, and that's William Connolly. He's a political philosopher. And in a wonderful book called The Ethos of Pluralisation, Connolly argues that the ghost at the, of, at the heart of liberal democracy is the insistence on a drive towards consensus. Indeed, he suggests that this drive, the drive towards collectivism on issues, is responsible for social disharmony, which is a kind of provocative thought. He writes, the stronger the drive to the unified nation, the integrated community, and or the normal individual, the more powerful becomes the drive to convert differences into modes of otherness. The biggest impetus to fragmentation, violence, and anarchy today does not emerge from political engagement with the paradox of difference. It emerges from doctrines and movements that suppress it. Connolly offers one of the most powerful statements I've come across in trying to unpack the question of how we conjure, on one hand, with the importance of acknowledging difference and the importance of collective action. Moreover, his analysis resonates in relation to social media, reminding us that the rifts and fractures now visible online are nothing new. What makes it different is the vis visibility of how we manage difference and how we work to ensure that difference does not enable those in power to assert their power over others. Social media, in other words, is a form of openly social communication where the rifts and differences in our politics and culture are made visible. Just a recent example, um, Leslie mentioned that I do work with the NRL. I've been working with them for over a decade, uh, doing research projects which, which ground their education programs around um, behaviour off the field and treatment of women. Um, this is what I think progress looks like. These women are in a relationship, they played opposite each other in state of origin. Now, that image, um, if, if some of you want to Google it when you get home, if you're not league fans, any league fans in the room? <laughs> um, so that's in, embedded in the uh, 2020 NRL ad. And um, Twitter lost its mind about this. And I got interviewed a little bit last week. Um, about th this image of these two women kissing and there was concerns from some of the people I would probably refer to privately as the league dinosaurs um, about, you know, we can't have the kiddies seeing this and, you know, and this, this great concern about women kissing and yet, I mean, um, without being graphic, I mean, if they, they should check their search histories, those sort of men, because I think there are contexts in which they think women kissing is a really good thing. Anyway, um, back to the real world and Elizabeth Warren, with whom we began. Let me let her speak for herself. So I announced this morning uh, that I am suspending my campaign for president. Um, I say this with a deep sense of gratitude for every single person who got in this fight, every single person who tried on a new idea, every single person who just moved a little in their notion of what a president of the United States should look like. Um, I will not be running for president in 2020, but I guarantee I will stay in the fight for the hardworking folks across this country who have gotten the short end of the stick over and over. That's been the fight of my life, and it will continue to be so. Hi, Senator, will, will you be making an endorsement today? We know that you spoke with both Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders uh -huh. yesterday. Uh, not today. Not today. Not today. I need Senator. some space around this, and I and want to take a little time to think a little more. Uh, I've been I've been spending a lot of time right now on the question of suspending and also making sure that this works as best we can mm -hmm. for our staff, for our team, for our, our volunteers. So it could, it, could be coming, it could be coming, but just not right now. Not right now. Uh, 
You know, I was told at the beginning of this whole undertaking that there are two lanes, a progressive lane that Bernie Sanders is the incumbent for and a moderate lane that Joe Biden is the incumbent for. And there's no room for anyone else in this. I thought that wasn't right, but evidently I was wrong. Senator, Senator Biden, what do you think? You weren't able to resonate more with voters and win any states. Uh, as I said, I think that uh, uh, I was told when I first got into this, there are two lanes. And I thought it was possible that that wasn't the case, that there was more room and more room to run another kind of campaign. <laughs> but evidently that wasn't the Senator case. Morris, can you talk a little bit about the role that you think that gender played in this campaign? Yeah. Gender in this race, you know, that is the trap question for every woman. Uh, if you say, yeah, there was sexism in this race, everyone says, whiner. And if you say, no, there was no sexism, about a bazillion women think, what planet do you live on? Um, I promise you this, I will have a lot more to say on that subject. Um, so just in case you didn't hear the final remarks she was making there, let me just emphasise them. She was asked about gender and she said, gender in this race? You know that is a trap question for everyone. If you say, yeah, there was sexism in this race, everyone says, why not? If you say, no, there was no sexism, about a bazillion women think, what planet do you live on? I promise you this, I will have a lot more to say on that later on. I look forward to what Elizabeth Warren has to say and thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Catherine. And we have plenty of time for questions. So while you're warming up with a few, I'll get, get the ball rolling, but please um, do have questions. Um, so I guess that last YouTube video leads to the obvious question is, what will it take to get a female president of the US or indeed another female prime minister in Australia? What will it take and what would your take on the social media um, role that would play out in that? Mm. Well, I think it is very interesting that uh, Julia Gillard's been reflecting very articulately on the misogyny she experienced in politics. And there's, you know, Anne Summers wrote a really interesting book on this too. Um, my take on this is that we have to think very carefully about how we have conversations. Um, to me, any conversation's got to start with listening, ideally. And I think understanding, um, seeking to understand where people are coming from and what their concerns are, um, and engaging with people who, are, I, I would call them the kind of unsure middle ground. And I think people on the left um, have to get much better at doing that and having those conversations and not being afraid of them, but not, but, but, but also sh showing care to listen. And I, look, the example I'd give, I did research for an SBS documentary series called Is Australia Sexist? on behalf of Macquarie. And, you know, we found that 86% of men and women in our survey thought that, um, you know, gender equality was important but then 52% of them thought feminism had gone too far, which you know, begged the question in my mind, were we heading for Brisbane and we ended up in Darwin? I just, you know, so there's a, there's a disconnect between um, what a lot of Australians think of as the fair go and the sorts of conversations that maybe end up in the echo chamber or end up becoming angry and polemic. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, questions from the audience. Yes. You, you'll have to stand up and shout because I don't think we have any um, roving. Oh, yes, there's a roving mic coming to you. <laughs> Up to you. Uh, so, one of the things that I've been grappling with recently is that I have been in positions, I have been in positions where I have 
not stood up for myself, being far too afraid of any kind of labels that might be given. As it is, I have a previous certificate and I am not aggressive by men because they don't run the money assertiveness. Uh, to go back to your question, Lindsay, uh, I think one of the things we really have a responsibility to do is to empower the children that we are in contact with to uh, I don't know to be actually to to be assertive, to be able to say what they feel, to call out that behaviour from the other sex. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think that's, you know, you're, you're making a powerful and eloquent point there. It's, you know, when we talk about, um, say, domestic violence and we say, or sexual assault and, and the, the prevalence of it in, this, in society and sexual harassment and the figures are still appalling, right? I mean, it is a problem of gender. It is, a, it is, it is, it is rooted in power, you know? It's, um, and it's something that we need to, I think, get very good at, including in our education system very young, because not all parents will have those conversations. Um, and um, we need to be talking to boys as well as girls, um, very young. But unfortunately, this is one of the problems about the polemics of politics is, I mean, when we tried to get the Safe Schools program um, mandated across schools via a national curriculum, there was a huge outcry from the conservative right saying that we were going to teach kids, you know, to change their gender or be gay or, you know, all those things are supposed to be terrible. Um, we'll be putting ideas in their heads. Um, and, you know, the great irony is that we know that child sexual abuse thrives where children are silenced, where their agency isn't recognised. And I think that is also very important, getting them to um, feel, again, it goes back to listening, listening to what they have to say. And w I think we're getting better with bullying, but you know, we shy away from talking about the gendered nature of, and, and the kind of power dynamics that enable so much violence. Um, you talked about, uh, you've talked about using the social media as uh, for building community and discussion and what about in the context of actual strategic campaigns to achieve yeah. change? Uh, how, do, how do you harness that from a feminist perspective? Well, I think what social media gives us um, the capacity to do is even working in small grassroots collectives um, is to tell our stories not in single file. If you think about sexual harassment and the hashtag Me Too thing, now, in the past, women have told their stories to their colleagues and friends. They've told them to counsellors. They've told them to the, sometimes to the courts if it, if it was an actual assault. Um, but it's been done in single file. What hashtag me who did was give a collective voice. And I think that's the very positive side of it. Um, and another example would be Destroy the Joint. Any of you here heard of Destroy the Joint on Twitter? Yeah, if you haven't, if you're on Twitter, go and have a look. They've been sending some fabulous feminist postcards around to celebrate um, International Women's Day. But, a bit, but what's interesting is that destroy the joint was a phrase that came out of Alan Jones's mouth. He said when we had a female governor general, female prime minister and female Lord Mayor, that women were destroying the joint. And Jane Caro, who's a really fabulous Australian feminist, just sent out one tweet one night. She said, oh, I'm sitting here on a Friday night with my glass of Chardonnay, working, at a ha working out how to destroy the joint. And all these other women piled in. And they actually mounted a very successful campaign uh, to stop a whole lot of companies uh, advertising on Alan Jones's program. And many of them have never returned. So I, th I think um, that's where humour and satire can be effective. Um, and. Um, but, but I also, I guess what I'm saying is the downside is if, if, it, if it just feeds into the polemics. Um, because what concerns me is where is the common discourse? Where is the civil discourse in a very fragmented environment? That's good. That was my question as well. Because, um, you know, you are a professor of media and communications. So what is the best communication? to 
bring people into that common discourse because Twitter is very much you talk to your friends and someone else talks to their friends. And there isn't a lot of overlap, but where is the, where is the best vehicle for having a, a conversation that supplies people? Well, I think one of the things is that coming back to this question about campaigning, if it's done cleverly, it's done with a sense of humour and it's done with a spirit of engagement and a kind of ethics of engagement, then what happens is that, that social media then, for, then um, it will go viral and or feed into traditional media commentary, as Leslie knows, because she does a lot of media commentary. It, it's, um, there is a feedback loop between these things. And we, we're seeing that with um, you know, climate change activism today. That, that things that often started as grassroots movements have now gone viral. So I, I, I think everybody has to um, look. I think we're all digital citizens, if you like. And um, but I think it's really incumbent on us to think about rhetoric and what does engagement feel like. You know, it's. I mean, this is something I wrote about ages ago, and other people have observed that. You know, with the rise of Pauline Hanson. A lot of the traditional media commentary from the highbrow media was sneering at her. And I can remember David Ma wrote this piece, um, which I talked to him about, I said, gee, I disagree, where he said he couldn't stand listening to her barmaid's voice in Parliament. And I said, well, my grandmother was a barmaid on the docks in Newcastle, you know? And of course, it's like the ba basket of deplorables comment. Um, it, it, you know, that, that or, or simply saying, well, Hanson supporters are all racist. Well, some of what they've said, yes, it is racist, but labelling them as racist is not the way to understand why are they projecting these anxieties onto people who seem different to them? What's, what is animating their anxiety? And I guess that's what, what I'm saying about trying to understand what it is that animates the anxiety in some men around women having power. And I think we've got to start the conversation really young. Yes. Uh, you were talking about the fact that we're having a little bit of political trouble educating children. Is there a place for the university to step in here? Or are we, um, is the horse already bolted by the time they reach 18? No, I mean, I think it's a, it's a lifelong conversation and I mean look, one of the reasons I love being at Macquarie University is that we do this stuff very well compared to other universities I've been at um, and I mean there are well you know moves um, not just you know rhetoric around it but there are actually um, there's a much greater awareness of, se of sexual assault and sexual harass harassment on campus and what Macquarie is doing around this um, is best practice and it's being taken very seriously. So yes, universities definitely have a role. Um, and, and also that, you know, the classroom is a place where we need to talk about things like gender and power and not just in the humanities because it affects, let's face it, all women's careers and um, it's, it's got to be an open and frank conversation. Hi Catherine, thanks for all the work you do on You'll help to get me promoted. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question, just sort of picking up from this, you know, you're saying that we should listen more to the concerns of men, for example. Um, I think I understand the concerns of men. It, the concern that many of them have is that they're losing all the power that they used to have. Um, I mean, what can you really do? Yes, if women have more power and we're more represented at senior levels, doesn't it follow that they will be less represented? It has to. How can how can they? You can't have both things. So how can you make them feel good about that? Well, look, I think there are many ways to talk about it. I tend to talk about the fact that we don't just have a, a pie one size that actually we can expand, if you like, the social pie. So if, I mean, for one thing, work-life balance for men is a challenge for many men, as much as it is for women. And that's why I talk about, you know, being a kind of, being able to be more fully human, um, not simply defining yourself by your career and so forth. 
Um, there's that. But I mean, I think the other way of making these arguments um, is is to there is very good research into how diverse cultures are more productive. You know, the neoliberal rhetoric about um, pr productivity is one that can work for feminists in making economic cases for diversity and not just gender balance, but cultural and ethnic diversity generally. Um, so, and I, I, you know, like I said, I, there are no simple solutions to this, but I guess what I'm saying is, starting by listening to what animates men's concerns without caving into them, but I guess having a sort of civil and a civilised dialogue and thinking about rhetoric is really important. And I mean, I, know, I remember a guy saying to me, oh, this is years ago, um, you know, a corporate guy, I, I'd given some talk at something and um, we were ha all having like dinner afterwards. And he said to me, look, I, I get what you're saying about the importance of diverse boards, but you know, to be honest, I feel like I had my mother at work which is a fascinating thought, right? But that's what was in his head. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you know, when men talk together, we talk about certain things and we swear. And I said, it doesn't bother me, you know? And so there's that, I think there, that sometimes the fears are very, well, they seem maybe odd to us, but yeah. Maybe I'll just have the last question then to, to round us off. So to, to round all that up, on the whole, would you say that social media has been a tool for good in equity or does the, the trolling and all of the other stuff outweigh that? Wh wh where's that balance? No, on balance, I think it's been a terrific tool. Um, and I don't want to be overly pe pessimistic. I guess I was trying to nuance the, the thinking around how do we use it and how do we ensure we use it in productive ways. But I come back to this thing that women were telling their stories in single file. Um, and there's now, um, through social media, a capacity for a collective voice. And it's been enormously effective in raising awareness about sexual harassment and resulting in prosecutions indeed. So on the whole, I think it's a very positive thing. And the more people in the conversation, the better. Well, on that very positive note, please join me in thanking Catherine for an illuminating talk. <laughs>